Hello, everybody. Your co-host, Neil Sohota here. We always talk about experiencing art. Well, our guests today, Meow Wolf, take this to a whole new level. They believe in full, immersive, interactive art. In fact, it's a living exhibit where we as the audience actually participate, experience, and become part of their art. So let's just enjoy it for a moment before we dive into the conversation. This is Artistic Intelligence, where we explore the intersection of art, sustainability, and technology. This show is brought to you in partnership with the United Nations ITU AI for Good, Changing the Story podcast, and State. Now let's join your co-hosts, Neil Sahota and Michael Ashley. Welcome to an episode of Artistic Intelligence. We've got two great guests today. We have Chadney Everett, who is the Senior Creative Director at Yawolf and working on the Denver installation. We also have Connor Peterson, who is the Technical Director, focusing on the production of interactive art for Yawolf's upcoming installations in Denver, Las Vegas, and Washington, D.C. Yawolf is comprised of over 200 full-time employees and hundreds of other collaborators. They create immersive and interactive experience that transport audiences of all ages into the fantastic realms of story and exploration. This includes arts installations, video and music production, and extended reality content. Chadney, Connor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good to have you guys on. We really appreciate it. So for those that don't know, what is the story behind Meow Wolf? Well, Meow Wolf is, on its, uh, just to describe it, it is a large, we make large scale immersive arts installations. Um, interactive, I think, is another key word that you can use. Um, so, our first uh, permanent large scale installation um, is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we're based. Um, it's 22,000 square feet of um, of art that was made not only by Meow Wolf artists, but then uh, collaborating artists we invited from the community. Um, and a lot of those spaces can change out. Uh, Meow Wolf was formed in 2008 uh, by a group of artists who really didn't feel like the um, traditional kind of art model had a place for them. Um, they were interested in uh, um, a kind of more collaborative art model. Um, and so, they started making their own installations. Of course, it was all out of pocket for years. Um, before we built the House of Eternal Return, which is our Santa Fe exhibit, we also built some 26 large-scale exhibits um, around the country, um, all out of pocket for them, right? So for the founders. So it was a, 
there was definitely some inspiration uh, after the largest of them, which is the Dew Return, which was a full-sized um, ship that was built inside of the Center for Contemporary Arts here in Santa Fe. Um, and it was a massive uh, lift to build this thing, right? And then it's up for a few months and has to get torn down. And, uh, and so, you know, pretty rational, you know, you can understand why uh, people were like, we, how can we do this but not have to tear it down? Because that was a bummer. Um, and so uh, the business model that we have was kind of developed out of that thinking um, that we have today where um, the founders chose to go for a non a, a for-profit model, I, I, I mean to say, I'm sorry. Um, and the reason is, is they wanted to make sure that artists could make a living wage that worked for Meow Wolf. Um, and, uh, you know, normally a company like that would go non-profit. Um, and they had ambition to build bigger uh, than they had been able to previously. Um, so at a scale that... Um, that was inaccessible to them uh, previously. Um, and so that's who we are today and, and, and kind of how we got here. Right now we have the exhibit in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I am the senior creative director on the Denver project, which will be the largest thing. It's the largest thing we have upcoming. It's scheduled to open uh, end of year 2021. Um, and uh, I will be moving up to Denver January of next year to get into that fully um and it will be um it's a 94,000 square foot building um so a very large it's a new build for this exhibit um five stories um and then prior to that um early 2021 we are opening our second exhibit after the house in santa fe which is our exhibit in, in uh, las vegas nevada uh which connor is also working on but i am not um and uh, yeah, so that's where we're at right now. Um, and many more projects in the works, but those are uh, not, uh, we don't talk about those quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, should we describe what it's like to be inside a Meow Wolf installation if you haven't By seen all it means, before? Kind of yeah. Do. Yeah. Please do. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so this is difficult to um, it's difficult to visualize unless you are in front of a computer and can just type it into a search engine. But um, if you don't have that luxury, maybe you're listening to us on a recording or on your headphones while you're running. Um, we imagine that you got like a hundred skilled young artists together, each who had their own interests and their own stories that they wanted to tell their own media, the kinds of things that they like to build and make. And then Imagine that you put them in a blender and had all of the artists work with whomever they wanted on kind of whatever project. Um, and then also imagine that you had just a kind of floating army of volunteers of people who were just happy to participate in building whatever it was that you uh, wanted to, to make. So you do that and you wind up with a very colorful, maximalist, just jam-packed uh, building that's like pretty much full of everybody's artwork. But unlike a museum or a gallery, there are no name tags on anything. One project, sculpture, installation, kind of blends almost seamlessly into the next one. Um, and so when you when you first see it and you're kind of experiencing it for the first time, which is um, a privilege that Nomi Wolfer has had for a long, long time now, um, it can it can be inspiring. It can be um, headache inducing as you try to take in all of the the details. Um, Time after time after time, you will see stuff that will make you feel inspired. Like, why didn't I ever think to tile my bathroom in this crazy psychedelic way? <laughs> like, why didn't I, like, why are all my walls in my house all white when I could have, like, my, my friends come and paint murals on all them? Um, and so this, I think, contributed to part of why this went essentially viral as, as an um, art practice. And then began, it began to make people start asking questions about, well, you know, do do we need to have uh, individual name tags on every single work of art? Is this, if, if there is such a popular interest in this and people who are willing to pay tickets, um, can we actually try to charge at the door like you would um, if you were putting on uh, like a house show or a rock concert for your friends in your punk house? Um, and so that is basically the setup for um, a lot of the business that Chadney is describing and what has now taken place in the last three years. 
And I would add to that that, yeah, thank you, Connor. That that really actually did a lot more than what I <laughs> yeah, uh, to explain the experience. There, there's also a quality to what we do where we're very interested in inspiring the next generation of artists. And that means seeing the hand of the artist in what we do. Um, so we don't, we're not generally looking for work that's too slick unless it is required to be slick. In other words, if you have a projection surface, please make it really nice. But um, when we're looking at sculpted items and things like that, we want to see the thumbprints of the artist. We want people to come in and look at the art that we've made and say, like, I could do that thing, you know? Like, I could go home and do this um, and inspire the next generation to make art the way that they, that comes natural to them and that they're inspired to do and to think outside of the traditional art models. I think you guys have really succeeded on that front because I've been lucky enough to actually see some of the work, experience the house return return, and it's really mind blowing. And it's amazing the community of artists you've created and the melding together of styles. But you know, that that I think point about essentially creating new forms of art and the new types of you know, new performances, new experiences, I mean where are we going with that, right? I, I see a lot a lot going on. I see a lot of technology being used. I mean, Connor, Chadney, I mean, what, what, what do you think is the near future here? Oh, my God. I, I have I a personal answer to that question. Please you answer. Go ahead, Chadney. No, no, please. I mean, the, um, the way that it's so interesting to see Meow Wolf interpreted by different groups who are interested in what we do. And probably the press that we see frequently, um, like kind of the, 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 if you just Google about this and, and read uh, news about Meow Wolf, you'll often see people describe it as the experience economy. And I mean, whether or not that's true or intentional, that we were part of the experience economy uh, is sort of, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that to the reader um, as an exercise, but like, um, for sure, Meow Wolf is interesting as a as a as a phenomenon because you gain a, you, when you get a ticket, you you can go into the exhibit. But and there's plenty of stuff to play with and do. But mostly people are there to just be part of the spectacle to see it. And like I mean, kids love it, but also uh, parents and adults um, and um, older folks like it as well. So. Um, we are, for better or for worse, um, kind of wrapped up in, in this narrative about the experience economy, the idea that people would want to, um, that they're willing to, to pay money just to have an experience happening. Um, and I, yeah, I, I feel uh, mixed feelings about that, but it's for sure true. When you go to Meow Wolf, like, regardless of how, how you go through the exhibit, what you decide to look at or fixate on or what you decide to do there, um, it kind of doesn't matter. Everybody who goes there has their own unique experience, I suppose. And this is different from like Disneyland or uh, like a theme park or something in that like there's usually like rides or attractions or um, long established um, nostalgic IP that people are um, engaging with. Um, I mean, we might have that somewhere far down the road, but in the meantime, what it is is very fresh. It's not stuff that you've seen before. People are not generally familiar with our characters and the, and the story. Um, and so it's new to them. And so it is a novelty, I suppose. Yeah, so yeah, and, and, I was going to just say the experience economy. Go ahead, Chetty. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say that uh, to that, we've discovered, and much to our surprise, that most of our guests, the great majority, are adults. Um, we thought we would get many more young people than we do. Um, and young people love what we do, but um, we're attracting far more adults than we are young people. Um, uh, at least to the Santa Fe exhibit, but I guess the demographics of different cities can determine uh, that. One of the things, though, too, to, to, to your point, Neil, is like we're, we, at least for as long as I've been with Meowulf, but for as long as I've been experiencing Meowulf, Meowulf has been very interested in saying yes to all avenues of expressing themselves artistically as a, as a group. And so what that means is there, there can be many forms of art that are elitist, you know what I mean? Traditionally kind of elitist, and they have a very kind of narrow idea of what they call art in finger quotes. Um, you know, um, there was a time when, uh, you know, photography was the new technology and it was like, you know, there was you know, kind of the new artists that were using that form and all of the kind of, you know, art world saying, no, that's not art, you know, um, et cetera. So the one thing about Meowulf is I think that 
we definitely have a more open idea, and I think technology has is definitely played a role in that from the beginning. I mean, uh, it's um, as much our technologists, I think, are as much our artists as, as anybody else in, in the building um, and contributing to the art, and um, and that to me is really exciting because art and technology have always been tied together from the very beginning. I mean, basically. The first art form is probably storytelling, and that might be the only art form that doesn't necess necessitate technology. <laughs> you know, um, as soon as you start building musical instruments, paintbrushes, <laughs> like anything, there's technology involved, right? Um, and so it's to be embraced, you know, um, because technologies can connect people. You know, art connects people, but technologies can double down on that connectivity. Um, and also, give you levels of accessibility um, that you might not have had before, uh, you know, um, it, almost any art form you can think about today, um, how like, what it meant to record an album, you know, in the 80s compared to today, you know? I mean, you had to curry favor with a record studio, they had to like you, then they, you know, are gonna, you know, pay for an expensive recording studio, marketing, distribution, all that stuff. Today, it's like a super affordable program on your laptop, you know, upload a video to YouTube, pay a small fee to get your song in a streaming service, and if you need any money at all, internet crowdfund, right? And so there's a direct connection between audience and artist. Um, and I think that that's kind of an analogy of uh, kind of, or that's one way to talk about how art and technology are serving each other, but it more broadly, that connection, that direct connection between artist uh, and audience is something that we're very interested in as well, right? Um, and taking the elitism out of the equation, right? So many of the people who come to see our installation are people who would never go to see a gallery show or a museum. Um, they don't, there are people who don't normally go uh, to artistic experiences like that, um, but we have designed a model that has an invitation into that artistic experience. Um, it's, we call it one of the kind of phrases we use is the accessible unknown, right? And the accessible part is the invitation in, the welcome. The unknown is the kind of potential transformative experience of art. When you say, when I hear you guys talk, some of these words leap off uh, the page to me, which is the elitism part, but also the experience. It seems to me this is the logical progression of art. Uh, what you're doing seems like Bertolt Brecht, the Dadas, as well as Burning Man, kind of all wrapped up in one in some ways, and I'm sure it's much more. But if you think about uh, going back to the history of art, as you were mentioning Chadney, thinking about what was uh, the artistic realm prior to this, in some ways it was an elitist experience, whether if you're going to, to the opera, it's very expensive, it was the upper class that was going to it. Absolutely. It uh, you know, beautiful paintings um, in in Italy back around the, in the Renaissance time. This was something I would say was a um, a passive experience. You got to stand a wall and look at a beautiful painting. This seems to me what you guys are doing. Going back to this word word experience is the logical progression of art. Uh, it's not that these other pieces of art disappear. All of these things still exist. We still have paintings. We still have music. We still have opera, radio all these ways to express ourselves, but now we're talking about something that's much more, which is the experience. Um, a participatory thing where um, you, they, the audience is contributing and building their experience with you and sharing something. But ultimately, if you look at all the art that I mentioned before, um, generally the creator wanted someone to feel something. They wanted to evoke a feeling within that individual. And I wonder, when there is an experience now, when it's so um, up for grabs in terms of it's something that we're creating together, it's an emergent phenomenon, what is it that you want the audience to feel? Is it something that you're creating with them? Hmm. Is it going to be political? Um, yeah. What are we yeah. trying to I, I, Can I answer really well, quickly? I think it's really yeah, important go ahead, Jenny. To, to encourage people to think, not what to think, right? And so you give them the tools that inspire them to curiosity, without telling them the direction that that curiosity is supposed to go in. That's my personal belief. And so the work I do is built around that. Now, other artists work differently. Um, and Connery have a different answer than I do. 
Oh, no, actually, I was going to riff off of that. I don't want to, um, I'm, I'm sensitive to the word elitism because I, yeah. I don't want to say that, that other artwork is elitist. That's, you know, because it's kind of pejorative. Um, I think that there is a ton of great artwork that is accessible that's being made outside of the confines in the Wolf right now. And, and just parenthetically, my hope is that people who are not familiar with what it's like to go through an art experience are interested in broadening the horizons after seeing a Meow Wolf um, exhibit. Mm -hmm. But um, something that Chadney was saying uh, earlier is actually really important. Um, when you make a very uh, accessible and broad experience um, to a, and that's pitched at a popular audience, um, or I mean, maybe maybe a better way of phrasing this is one thing that, that I think that we can do and that we do really well with our large audiences, um, making them feel inspired afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, what Chadney was saying earlier about how the fingerprint, the artist's fingerprint is actually somewhat of a Meow Wolf signature um, is, is key to that. Um, I, I recall just what it was like um, when I was a kid going to um, various um, exhibitions like and I'm, I'm using sorry I shouldn't call Disneyland an exhibition but like if you go see like really professionally made quote themed artwork there's nothing about it that would make you feel like you could do that yourself right when you consume it when you see it um, and I'm, I'm and when we leave the the fingerprints in the artwork um, and in, and work with artists who don't have a ton of training. Chevy and I, by the way, are professional facilitators, basically for uh, for artists who haven't done this before. Um, when you when you work with them, um, or when people see their work, uh, they will they will see um, something accessible in front of them. I hope when they when they depart the exhibit. Um, so that's important. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll stop my answer there. So I would, yeah, thank you, thank you, Connor, and, and, and thank you for bringing that up because I want to clarify. I was saying, I'm trying to say that the market, not the artist, uh, has some elitism in it, right? I was a gallery artist for years, and one of the things that drove me nuts about that is that none of my friends could afford my work, you know? And that is like, there seems to be something wrong with that, that there's something built into the model where n none of the artist's peers can afford their work. Um, and so... That was something that actually excited me about coming to work with Meow Wolf is that there's this accessibility there. Um, it's the art and uh, admittance to the art is as accessible to a billionaire as it is to someone who works a regular job, you know? Um, and I um, think that that is good. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. That, that, that is, that is that is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's more democratic, right? I mean, it's, it's not just the wealthy who can kind of have this thing in secretive way in their house. Um, and so, um, yeah, but I, I certainly don't mean to say that, you know, I mean, I was a gallery painter for years. I love that work and I'm still, a, you know, obviously a great admirer of it. Um, to, the, to the point you asked, Michael, about um, kind of, the, the kind of, experience and um, passive experience, et cetera. Connor and I just talked the other day about kind of the um, uh, kind of merging of, of cinema and gaming, right? Gaming, you know, video gaming is like the, one of the fastest growing industries in the world, right? And why, you know, basically it's, it's, it's evolved into becoming something very cinematic. Um, they use a lot of the tools of cinema to make video games now, same kinds of, you know, kind of shots and cuts and like that. The major difference is, is that with cinema, you're a passive viewer, right? You're this kind of omniscient fly on the wall. And with video games, you are the protagonist at the center of the story, right? And you can help define the story within certain parameters. And that excites people. People want to be engaged at that level, you know? Um, and I think that that is not only why gaming is doing as well as it's doing, but why eventually, um, be it a generation or a couple from now, cinema and video games are, are going to merge basically into a new kind of entity where we get to be at the center of story. Um, and that will be kind of a commonplace new experience that we have of story. Um, and that again is like a thing that is me all of doing it at that level. No, but we're aspirational and it's something, you know, and we, we understand that like how vital it is to put uh, our participants 
um, make them essential to the experience and, and that the, the experience of our spaces isn't really activated until they activate it, right? It doesn't come alive until they bring it to life. Um, and, uh, you know, we do better at it in this place than we do in this place, et cetera. And some places are meant to be more kind of just analog and experienced in a kind of more uh, kind of traditional way. And others very much need the uh, kind of participation of uh, the guest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, if I could just throw in there real fast. Please. Um, so in addition to all the artists and sculptors and carpenters and painters and all of all of the people who make a meow wolf um the physical meow wolf there has always been a um, contingent of people who are interested in telling a story in that area um and so but how do you write a story for a building or like a, a house within a building that you can walk through um and this is also kind of touching on an earlier topic which is um, when people call Meow Wolf immersive, it's because the, the narrative and the story for the space, and there, and there is actually a hyper detailed narrative for most of the stuff that we've done since the, the do return. Um, they, you cannot experience it just as though you were flipping through a book instead of telling a story like, like we was, everybody, I mean, still we draw out a narrative arc on paper and talk about the characters and flesh out their backgrounds, et cetera. But then we go and actually make the artifacts. And it's, it's not like really an escape room. Like that wasn't the intention, but like we actually make the things that, that are the story. Um, and sometimes that means inventing a clock that will like just go haywire on its own every three minutes, or it means um, making like putting a video screen in an unexpected place. And so technology um, plays a big, important role there. Um, yeah. So the the storytelling aspect of of Meow Wolf uh, kind of emerges from uh, from the fact that narrative is part of the art form as well. And that narrative is nonlinear. By it must be nonlinear because one of the essential rules of Meow Wolf is that once we sell you a ticket, it's up to you. We don't give you a map. We, we won't tell you how to experience our experience. And so um, you decide, you create your own path through it, which means that our narratives, it makes them the narrative more complex if they're gonna function well, um, because you can experience, you know, this section here, then this section here, and you know, I mean, and you're, you're gonna start to put together the pieces in a unique way that maybe nobody else will put them together in quite that order. Um, and it also means that the narratives need to, um, it, it makes them kind of, I don't know how to say it better, but more dreamlike in a way, right? Uh, they become a little bit less um, kind of rigid um, and more malleable. Um, yeah. That's, uh, that's very David Lynchian of you. you know, David, David Lynch does that for his films. It's doing our work well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's really amazing because, you know, I think everyone kind of gets their own experience, right? Because they're going through and interacting with the art all differently. It's like it's a unique personal experience for each person. But I, I'm, I'm curious because you, you have quite the mix of like technology and I'll call it like, you know, tried and true traditional art going on. We live in this world of emerging technology like artificial intelligence and extended reality. What are those technologies giving or giving like Meow Wolf for you guys like you the ability to do that you could not do otherwise? Like what are the new doors is it actually opening? I defer to Connor to start this one. <laughs> yeah. Technical director. Well, um <laughs> okay. I I can't speak too specifically about this because um, I shouldn't at this point in, in our projects. But here's what I can say. Ever since we started telling a story in a given like space, like, okay, so we've got a house, there's a, there's a mantle, there's a fish tank, et cetera. Um, we have always wanted to, to make it, to do things like, well, what happens if you, what happens if you pull the book off the shelf? What happens, what happens if you pull the book off the shelf and then take it across the room and then put it over here because maybe you read somebody's uh, journal entry about that. And like, this is basic um, escape room technology that I'm talking about right now. Like most of this stuff comes out of maker movement um, type things like, oh, okay, we might put an RFID tag on that book and then sneak in like an RFID reader over there. But, but extrapolate that from, a, from that a little bit. If you had a system that was keeping track 
of who or what moved the book or when the book was moved or um, any of the other smart gadgets or objects in the space. If you had a system that could keep track of that, then you could start stringing together um, bigger logic that would apply to the whole exhibit or maybe multiple Mia Wolf exhibits. Um, mm -hmm. And so and a lot of interest in that because that's in some ways, a, it sounds like a very entertaining game actually. <laughs> um, but, but there's, but there's crazy challenges involved in that. Like, um, well, how do you know who moved the book, you know? Um, and how interested are you in, in getting their identity really like for, as a pa as you know, like patron number 47 B um, just so that you can keep track of like the state of their sort of their progress, of the narrative um, there's that major issue. Um, and then also like, and we get this a lot, like people are interested in, I mean, have always been asking, like, is there an app for that? Um, we actually had an app for the due return back in 2011, which is uh, forgotten about, but it let you um, control some of the objects in the show by like poking at like your touch screen on your phone, which was cool, but it only worked if you're on the exhibit Wi-Fi. Is there a, a possibility that we could do something cool with a mobile app if it were um, somehow like more carefully threaded through the exhibit? That might be a thing. Um, but like, we're, we're still in the process of, of figuring that out. Like, like all things at Mia Wolf, um, we're developing 10 different things simultaneously, um, and, and allowing, uh, the, the creative process, um, to inform our decisions as we go. Um, so we're definitely interested in that. And, and we might like mostly what I do now is track down, um, like my engagement of that is tracking down uh, just the actual technical implementation of, of everywhere that such a virtual thing might have to interface with the physical exhibit. Um, so that's not like an emerging technology like that, that people are, are really excited about like AI or like predictive analytics or uh, that sort of thing. Um, those emerging technologies show up in what our artists pitch to us. I want to make this video screen that does this. I want to, um, I want the, this table over here to recognize when I put a, a particular object on there. Um, that stuff is usually not very flashy at Meow Wolf. It's, it's hidden. It's, it exists. It's just part of what people are doing as part of their creative process when we partner with them. Uh, generatively written audio or that sort of thing. Um, but it will, when you see it in the exhibit, you won't know it unless you're a technologist and you know what to look for, if that makes sense. It, yeah, it will it just look like magic. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes the tech, yeah, or, you know, the, the tech is a part of a kind of problem solving, right? It's, it's really like, um, okay, so we have an ambition that eventually we want to take the experience of Mia Wolf outside of the building right like let's break free of the tyranny of the walls and like you know get it out into the city um this is something i've been kind of thinking about for a long time like having this ambition that eventually we do take over like maybe a little section of a town you know that's gone derelict or something and like we start to like another you know and then the, the grand vision is you know that like this becomes the kind of tendrils that go out into society and like we're you know kind of it merges with society in a certain sense, like the creativity merges with society and becomes just integrated, you know? Um, and then you, it's hard to find the borders, right? Like how, so how do you begin to imagine that? Well, the first place you go is thinking about the technologies you can use uh, to do that thing, right? Um, and so to what Connor's saying, we are working on some things that we can't really talk about quite yet, but, um, but that will eventually be revealed. Um, and uh, and we have these kind of grand yeah grand visions. I uh, read it. Chuck Klosterman had a book a few years ago where he proposed the idea of simulation theory. Mm -hmm. And as I especially hear you talk earlier, Chadney, and talking about um, how cinema and video games are merging, it seems to me this it's not inconceivable that we are living in some sort of simulation because. Mm -hmm of the rapid way in which our technology is allowing us to create fully immersive worlds that we're living in. Maybe that's where you're going and you can't tell us about it yet. Um, oh, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, it seems to me that that is a kind of art realm that we're going to, again, going to the back to that word, word experience, which is you're creating these wonderful experiences. And just like you said before, where you, it, the, the sense of where art begins and re, where reality begins 
becomes blurry, right? And, and I wonder what your thoughts were about that. So this is all part of the kind of a thing that we have talked about before, but it's about creative agency and empowerment of people. Um, and it's uh, the, the creative agency to define yourself and your environment. Um, and I think that technologies are the thing that's helping to do that. Um, they are, they're showing themselves to be, look, you know, there's complications in, in everything, right? And so I'm going to talk at a very surface level, um, but like, um, you know, uh, and again, this is something we talked about in the same way that like Uber and Airbnb have like uh, utilized technologies to shift, uh, you know, economic agency um, from professional drivers and hoteliers to everyday people. Um, uh, technology is doing the same thing for artists, right? Um, and I think that that is a thing that's, that's not just specific to industry in economics, but it's actually something more broadly Technology is allowing people to uh, define themselves outside of the normal professional system where they might be defined um, and, and kind of develop their own value um, in a certain sense. And I think that that's really exciting to me and how art can serve that and how we can art is paired with that technology as a part of like this creative um, kind of uh, Agency is the best word, right? Like creative agency of yourself um, and, and your life. Uh, that excites me. And so like to integrate that idea into society, you know what I mean? I know, I know it sounds a little bit nefarious when you think about like these you know, kind of tendrils moving in, into society, but I, I really do mean it in the kind of kindest and most benign way as, as, a, as, a, as a means of empowerment. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, that... That, uh, that people can use kind of, you know, curiosity. Um, uh, I think that, you know, in a world that is growing more and more polarized, um, curiosity is the self-administered cure for ignorance, you know? Um, so curiosity and art um, and engagement uh, in uh, our common humanity while celebrating our differences, you know, and that kind of us being creative together. We had a we had a guest Michael Gerber on uh, a few episodes back on on changing the story, and he's a, a spiritual person. And he was saying, if we were created in in God's image, the highest thing that we can do is to be creators. And it seems to me, uh, again, I know we're talking about that word elitism, and I mean it in in a good way, that by using technology and the mechanism that you're talking about, we're freeing people to be creative in ways through technology. That would never have been possible before. Not not many of us can can paint like Michelangelo, but through the miracle of technology, we are almost super people. We can do things that are that seem way beyond our, our innate capabilities, and that to me is very exciting. I'm leaving space for Connor if you want to answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have I have thoughts about that. Um, I mean, technology has not reached the full like it has not reached the full masses technology especially the latest technology is also elite but in a different way it doesn't require education necessarily so much as it requires you to have access um and there so there's some um i i would point out that there's so there's access problems with technology i say this as a former educator um but um for sure, uh, every time that we develop a new technology, it will it brings a new mode of expression or ideas to the forefront that people hadn't yet considered. And suddenly, if it's your time, if that technology is for you and you get it and you happen to be standing in the right place at the right time, you might find yourself suddenly empowered as an artist. And what I mean by this is like, think back to um, the advent of photography, but also the demise of analog photography for a period of time. And printmakers are really kind of in a similar boat um, for, for a period of time, like certain techniques that, that rewarded people who like to work in meticulous or particularly like scientific ways, like were in vogue. That was the aesthetic. And for that period of time, those people um, had an opportunity to uh, participate fully in what that, um, what that creative, uh, 
like world was like. Um, now things are a little bit different. Like when we talk about emerging tech, like let's say that let's take mixed reality or augmented reality, for example, it's just sort of emerging tech that, that is super interesting right now because it calls into question all kinds of things about like simulation theory or like um, online identities or uh, how could you represent yourself with like a cool overlay to other people. That's great. But also that requires access to those headsets and participation in being able to build or model that kind of stuff. But at the same time, for a certain group of people, that's going to um, enable kinds of expressions that we had never even thought of. And that is, is fascinating to watch the, the narrative, I think, of um, art, creativity, and society and culture being written um, right in front of us. You know? mm -hmm. It seems like, too, though, that the nature of technology has become more and more accessible, doesn't it? Like when you think of like, the beginnings of automobiles, televisions, radios, like computers, um, cell phones, et cetera. It's like there's this kind of, you know, kind of they're, they're only for people who can afford them in the beginning. And then the be there's this kind of ubiquity, <laughs> that kind of trend that tends to happen, you know. Um, and so, as, as you said, where we are right now, Connor, um, you know, um, and of course, there's going to be new technologies that keep being born and it'll be this kind of, it's just these waves that flow in, you know what I mean? So these new technologies will be inaccessible initially, but then most likely grow to be more accessible as they uh, age. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I sincerely hope so, because I think, you know, we've been talking about technology mm -hmm. and art, and, you know, and the enablement, but I think it also improves accessibility, right? If yeah. I'm a, a painter in a small village somewhere, Suddenly, have the capability that people around the world could actually see my my art, right? Absolutely. And kind of run, running on that that guideline, um, I, I feel like there's got to be more emphasis in art because it's a great influencer, it's a great motivator. We've actually seen even the effect of encouraging people to you know adopt more sustainable practices around like even like the SDGs. I, I'm going to ask Chadney and Connor each one of you this question. What advice would you give an aspiring artist today? Mm. Oh um. The advice that I would give an, an aspiring artist today is realize that you do not need to stick to any particular established medium, um, especially if we're talking about technology, and we are, um, that anything, any piece of software, any display or output technology, any piece of hardware for the, across the last, I don't know, 50 years, all of that has tons of untapped potential, things that were never said by the, by the pioneers of that field. And it's all just sitting there. A lot of it is just like, um, like even if you have old computer or old software or old anything, um, it is not obsolete when it comes to art making. And all of that stuff is at your fingertips. And also in the process oftentimes of um, taking on like an older technology or, um, or any technology really, and making it do what you want to get up and sing, you will learn tons of interesting things that will feed every project that you do in the future. And that is what I would say. Nobody should be afraid of picking up tech, regardless of, of whatever the baggage it might have or what your preconceived notions are. The trick, of course, is to approach a technology without fear and without any sort of preconceived notions of what it should do. Um, I'll just add that a lot of the time, the most interesting artwork that people make comes out of when people are misusing the technology or using it for a purpose that it wasn't originally designed for. That's what gets me excited. And um, I love working with young artists to see what they make of stuff that um, should have been put away in, in a dusty shelf a long time ago, you know? Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would actually just in, in certain ways parrot what Connor said. I think that the most important thing you can do is expand your idea of what it means to be an artist, um, you know, because the more limited you are, the more narrow your idea of what is defined as art, um, the narrower your work, you know what I mean, in a certain sense, um, unless you're really a, a specialist in kind of focusing, you know, you, you know, like Hiro makes sushi kind of, you know, <laughs> focus. Um, but I mean, there's so much potential out there. And, um, you know, I think that in my personal thinking, and I, and I could be an outlier, I think that, that one of the things 
that I kind of see technology moving towards as far as how it interfaces creatively with humans is that it's giving us the potential to make our lives as our art in a certain sense, right? And especially in the way that we kind of uh, portray ourselves in the world and stuff like that. It's, it's, a, it's a tool that has a lot of power for connectivity, you know? Um, and so, or, you know, certain technologies. So this expansive idea of, of what art can be, I mean, um, there, is so, there are so many new forms now. I mean, there are books now being written about memes and meme culture, right, and the history of memes. And it is a new kind of language and art form, right, that didn't, that's only existed for a short period, but is rich with like its specific language, uh, you know, that it uses and, and, and visual kind of language as well. Um, and uh, it's as, as rich as any other. There are, there are people who um, are studying texting language, right? And like the language of texting is like certain linguists, I, I watched this one TED talk from this one linguist who was talking about the language of texting and how he feels like it's among the most advanced kind of communication we have now, you know, I mean, it's just this very straightforward and it has a very kind of, very well kind of uh, evolved uh, language that it uses, right? So technologies are, um, are powerful tools that can encourage new kinds of creativity, right? Um, in so many ways, in ways that you couldn't imagine, right? Like you wouldn't think that oh, texting, you know, and there, there's people who've written books via text, right? And delivered them to their audience, like one text at a time, you know, um, there are so many possibilities. So to be open to that, and uh, and of course that means to be open as a human being so we can get back to your spiritual <laughs> guest and like kind of be more expansive in your thinking, you know. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's wonderful advice. And that I love that word expansive. I, I feel like this whole conversation is speaking to that, that idea of expansive and making your life a piece of art. Uh, this has been wonderful, guys. Uh, if people want to learn more about what you're doing and get in touch with you, how can they do so? Uh, go to our website, meowwolf.com. Um, all of, you know, pretty much that's the hub for everything we do. And it can direct you uh, to not only who we are as a company, but the work that we do. Um, and hopefully eventually be able to buy tickets to come visit our exhibits uh, if we figure out a way to reopen them. Uh, it's something we're all struggling with. Um, uh, yeah, so meowwolf.com is, uh, is the best way to reach us. Thank you very much. Great. Well, Chadney, Connor, thank you for being so much on artistic intelligence and giving us and our audience a chance to see the world through your artist eyes. Really Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Hey, if you like today's show, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment. If you've been enjoying the Changing the Story podcast series, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you. Thank you.